Hello everyone to Double DM episode 51 about DM tools and what they do. Obviously some quick announcements as always as part of our pre-show. This episode we tried a lot of different editing techniques so please excuse any audio issues or irregularities as I still have to get used to this new process. But I want to thank David and Jonathan from Reckless Attack for sending me the general pointers and guides on how to navigate this hopefully better editing style and software. Next up is Why Your World Matters 3. Well, as always, it still, it will stay in, well, as always, it will stay in post-production for a few weeks. But I did already do the hardest work for it, the syncing of the tracks. So probably two to four weeks from now, you will see Why Your World Matters 3 in podcast format. We also hit 4,000 followers on Twitter just before our real anniversary with this podcast, which will be the February, which will be February 7th. Oh, and also we are very close to a big milestone when it comes to plays on the podcast. And we are so much trying to hit that goal as well before the one year. So if you haven't, please leave a five star rating on Spotify, a review on Apple podcast or wherever, or just simply tell your friends, family, and also your pets, your cat loves us. I can tell you that this is the best way to get the show out there. You know this already if you have listened to another episode. But with that, I have probably talked enough and will let you guys enjoy the double dm intro and the episode after bye Hello and welcome to Double DM episode 51. With me, as usual, is my lovely co-host Emil. How are you today? I am doing rather fine, I would say. Rather fine? Not enough sleep. Simple. Oh, the classic. Yeah. Did you also get the ice front? The um, ice rain? I haven't noticed it. Okay, but... because at, at like 5 a.m. Berlin time. Mm -hmm. There was a lot of ice rain. Okay, no, no, that, that's when I went to sleep, basically, 4.30 or something. Okay, no, at at like 5 a.m. there was um, this huge pour out of ice from the top. It, it really felt like there was uh, so much, <laughs> there was so much ice and rain coming down. It was crazy. And I woke up from that because it basically... Uh, since you you can see my window on on the webcam, right? Um, yeah. The the listeners obviously can't, but imagine you sleep and you have a window in your room as you normally do, and all of the rain and ice, and I'm talking actual ice, not not snow, but ice, right? <laughs> Hitting your windows for like ten mm. minutes straight, and 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 that woke me up, and then I went back to sleep, and I slept through my lecture today. <laughs> <laughs> because uh, I um, yeah, I was like, Fair. yeah, understandable. <laughs> I did so as well yesterday. Nearly slept through it. Just forced myself to get up at seven to get to the lecture, and mm -hmm. then as soon as the lecture started, I just fell asleep again. And then at the halfway point, I woke up again. So uh, it's just too early sometimes. <laughs> It's just too early. It's sometimes. just too early. I, but I is can't. it really though? If is I'm it, awake, is it really though? Until two a.m. and then the lecture starts at eight. It is. Yeah, too I mean early. that sounds like a you problem. Yeah, it is, but it's still too early for me. I need to change that, or I should change it. But eh, eh. <sighs> just make sure you get the right amounts of sleep, everyone. And if you, you have early appointments, go to sleep early. There isn't a way around that. Also, what happened this or not this week, but last week? It started the week after, <laughs> um, the week before that. Even new Attack on Titan. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Ah, uh, final season part two. Um, I mean, there are some speculations that there might be even a part three already. That they that they are working okay. on a part three for the ending, but that will probably just be a movie or something, just like three episodes of of epic end battle or something. Mm -hmm. I don't know what they're gonna do. I'm just here for the ride, actually. I I love the first. At this point, it's two episodes um, yeah. out. Both were great. 
but I can't wait to see the Levi squad in action once again. I hope that they will be in action because of what um, happened in the episodes. I obviously won't spoil it for anyone, but it's great. Plus one to that. <laughs> it's, it's just it's just a lot of fun watching those. It, it's again really, really, really good showcasing of subtle storytelling, in my opinion. Yeah. Because they do... One thing I, I think Attack on Titan doesn't do, at least in this season, and actually all seasons kind of, it doesn't insult its audience, right? Definitely not. It knows what the viewers know and how they're going to interpret stuff and then plays with that. But it doesn't insult them by pointing out the obvious. And in that way, subtly tells us everything we need to know, but only enough to keep us guessing, but guessing in the right direction. You yeah. never know what's going to happen, but you still guess what's going to happen. And that's exactly. what's... And that is what keeps you surprised. Yeah, but yeah, not exactly. actually being a full-on surprise. Yeah, yeah. You, it, it's... you roughly know the direction where it's going, mm -hmm. but there are a billion possible ways where it actually could go. But yeah. the rough direction is set. Yeah, and that is forward. Ends. That's yeah. an inside joke for people that watch the series. But okay, yeah. Um, moving on from Attack on Titan because I don't want to spend too much talking about it before I spoil or something. Yes. Did you have anything TTRPG related this week? Just our session 0.5 for Titan's Call. Oh yeah, we did that. Yeah, th that was a lot of fun. Getting to know the characters, how they would interact with certain groups or uh, certain situations, and how they would interact with each other. Mm. It it was mm. it was a lot of fun. Mm. And mm. thanks for Th jamming it the way you did. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Tell me a little bit about Aiden. Just simple stuff, so we get people hyped. <laughs> then let me ask, what do you want to know about him? Oh, um, so Aiden is a guard, right? He is, at the beginning of Titan's Call, he will be a city guard. And without going into why he became a city guard, and um, what's his feeling on the position of being a city guard? Is he, is he the upright, I am the officer that upholds peace is he the nice guy that makes sure the citizens are okay is he like is he is he about duty is he about protection of other people what's why is he a city guard mostly about protection of civil uh, civilians and people who can't protect themselves but mm -hmm. doesn't disregard the law or the duty he has still as a city guard mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so he's trying to be as fair as possible with everyone without insulting the position he got you could say that mm -hmm. yeah he upholds yeah. the position right he, exactly. he the position comes with some benefits but obviously also some obligations and he upholds those both sides he uses the benefits he has to help people but the obligation he will uphold as well okay yeah i, th I think that i think that's at least already enough so people can get to know aiden a bit we don't want to talk too much about it because mm. Titan's Call is still a little bit far out. But also you made yourself puke in that session. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but not just me. No, two characters were, <laughs> two characters started puking. It was a lot of fun, but uh, since people won't be um, listening to that anytime soon, at least not publicly probably, um, because that session was just for us uh, to get a little bit into the how do we run an actual play, how does that work, to understand because extra plays are run a lot differently from my home games and i reckon that it's like that for a lot of people so people if you want to start an actual play show I'd say i would suggest do some testing sessions oh, because yeah. um even critical role is too long for me often the thing is the episodes just need to be short and precise and yeah. that's often a lot of diff world of difference to what other people have so i would say as an advice for actual play podcasters or actual play people that want to start an actual play make sure that you understand um how to run an actual play session first yeah and because it's often different yeah and it plays way different than playing in your home games as well mm. as a player you have to be a lot more descriptive because people don't see what you are doing they just hear what you're doing you can't make the gestures your character makes yourself first of all from a podcasting editing perspective that can get messy real quick with the audio and oh, your yeah. editor will hate you for it <laughs> i i have trained myself for double dm to not move my head much when i talk 
and basically always stare at the point for like an hour and the microphone directly in front of me. And I still hate myself for <laughs> the amount of difference I have sometimes in my voice. But really, for your actual play, you can't make big gestures, first of all, because of that, second of all, because no one will see them. So you, you have to describe them. You can still make them, right? You can still play however you want. Often, th that is one thing I also have to say. You can still play however you want. But really, you need to think about if you want to make an actual play, that, that you're also producing a show. You're not only playing a game, you're producing a show. The difference can just be, do you want produce the show to just for fun? Do you produce that show to make money? Do you produce that show for a project? Do you produce... That's something you need to think about. You don't just, right, most people just start out with, let's make an actual play and just play, and that works. But I like to listen to the ones with high production quality that have engaging stories, engaging characters. These are all things that most of all those are the people that made thoughts about doing an actual play first. Or have since then, since starting, made sure that they've put those thoughts in and trained themselves for that. Yeah. So yeah, um, I don't want to discourage anyone from doing an actual play, but it's more than just a home game. And I think y you need to know that. Definitely. Um, I also didn't have any sessions except for the session 0 0.5 since we last had an episode go up, or at least at least since we last recorded something for an episode. I only have a session today on day of recording on Thursday, the 20th of January, where we will probably meet some dragons we call to paradise and talk to them, but I don't know yet. It's... Calling a lot of dragons sounds like a fun one. Oh yeah, it is. A, a horrifying or terrifying Well, idea. the the whole campaign idea was always, and we knew that, was to not save the dragons, not kill the dragons, but to discover the ancient dragon chronicles. Mm. And that now included um, this one god dragon is dead and he's evil and he's supposed to be revived. We need to stop that because if he does, because there was an ancient um, ancient prophecy saying by one of his brother, other god dragons, if you get revived, I will burn the whole entire world down to the ground that's a statement Th that's a statement but that's a problem because we live on that world and we don't want it to get burned so we need to stop the resurrection Th that's a good incentive right? right trying to not get the world burned to ashes is generally a good thing to s yeah. to do trying to stop that yeah right yeah i yeah i agree yeah 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 <laughs> in the real world i would try to as well because i actually like living in this world yeah it, it, it's it can be a lot of fun so, yeah, uh, understandable incentive, <laughs> understandable motivation. <laughs> stopping the uh, apocalypse. Yeah, um, yeah, stopping the apocalypse is great. Um, the problem is, even if he were to re be revived and, be and the other dragon wouldn't burn down the whole world, he would um, rule the whole world, which wouldn't be any better. So, no. So, yeah, we need to stop that. And maybe we will have our first advancement in that direction today. Maybe? I don't know. I'm, really I'm looking. For, I'm very looking forward to it. Um, but yeah, I will tell about that next time. So with that, I think we have recapped our weeks, and we will see or hear you guys after the ads for our discussion about DM tools. GemFirefly.com combines nerdy interests and aesthetic attitude into one awesome store. Find shirts of the highest quality and softest comfort along with home items such as mugs, blankets and flags. Collections like the dungeon glitch geeky designs or the spicy not safe for work section offer a variety of unique graphics perfect for your message, attitude and lifestyle. Profits from the shop have planted thousands of trees to fight hunger and climate change while also supporting notable charities and game community causes. Check out the link below or visit GemFirefly.com com and skim your favorite shirts right now and with that welcome back to the episode today we are talking about gm tools so emil we talked about gm tricks already what is the difference between those terms oh okay first up in gm tricks we talked about things like pausing tone changes in your voice using specific things to evoke specific emotion at the table for example 
to showcase your players something to make the feeling of the scene conveyed to your players. And that's what tricks are. And tools, I think, are more physical, easy things to understand. It's um, not necessarily a yin and yang situation. It's not entirely cut off from each other. But the thing is, the tricks always are, well, I change my voice. That evokes certain emotion in players in in the scene and in the character right and with with the gm tool we're more talking about the specific things you can for example hold in your hand or use to do certain things the complementary things to that right mm -hmm. you can do a lot with just your voice with just your facial expression with your gestures with your body language to evoke certain emotion at the table. But there are also other things you can use. There are other things you can use to create immersion. There are other ways that help you as a DM do something. And that are the tools. Yeah. So yeah, tools are more like the physical things that help you in doing something and are less you doing something. Right? That's the distinction. The tricks are what you do. And the tools are what help you in doing something. Exactly. Alrighty. So now that we've established that, I think we can mostly categorize the tools into two categories, obviously with some overlaps, but the offline and online tools mm -hmm. or the digital and physical props. Or tools yeah, use. that's one distinction, for example. I had another distinction between in-play and out-of-play. Tools mm. that help you prep and tools that help you when you're playing at the table, right? That's another distinction you can have. Another distinction could be uh, that maybe a little bit more thorough, but obviously there are game-specific tools, especially for the bigger role-playing games like D&D, Call of Cthulhu, Pathfinder. They have tools that are way more specific, suited to them only, that obviously help the people that run these games make it easier for them to run. Yeah, That could be another distinction generally. So first up, I, I wanted to ask you, Niels, before mm -hmm. we dive into each specific tool we, we use, right? That's This episode is about the tools we use. The tools we use to, to help us game mastering our games and also why we use them. Niels, before we dive into the specific tools we have and why we use them, I wanted to ask you generally mm -hmm. how many tools you use. Is there a limit to tools you can use? Is And, and especially also... How do you use tools in general, right? Not, not talking about the specific tool, but anything that we have to discuss before we dive into specific tools. How important are they, for example? I think especially in the preparation phase and in the planning phase, tools are awesome. Basically, the more the merrier because they just help you prepare your games better. Mm -hmm. But in play, more is less because you don't get distracted too much obviously you have the minimum amount that you need to run your game smoothly but don't try to add any tools that you don't necessarily need because then you feel forced to use them and this gets distracting a lot mm -hmm. or could get distracting mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. i very much agree with that I, I think tools are supposed to help you right so evaluate which tools actually help you and how they help you. And then you can understand which tools you use. Maybe you can find tools that help you better, right? Yeah. Well, one big part of tools is which tool helps me the best? Which tool is the best tool for me? Every DM has their different approaches. One tool I think we don't even discuss because it's too specific. But generally having, for example, encounter tables don't work for me. Mm -hmm. But for others, they do wonders. And it's lovely to see that they do wonders for them, but they just don't do for me. So yeah. again, this is find what works best for you and you're going to have the best time possible. Exactly. So I think we shall get into the more specific side of the tools we use. Yeah. Then the first question I would have for you is what is the most used tool by you and why? Okay. If we're talking D&D, let's talk about D&D first. I think the answer is obvious mm -hmm. because it's D&D Beyond. Yeah. I think D&D Beyond is basically a Wikipedia for D&D. Yeah. Or D&D 5, sorry. Not 
the older editions of D&D, obviously, but D&D 5. Because you can search every content that is D&D related on that site. You can find every book. Yes, you need to buy them again. Licensing people. Very important, right? Obviously, yes, I also want to have the physical copies and digital, but that's different licenses and all of that stuff. But if you own, like me, a lot of content on D&D Beyond, it's so good to have all the stat blocks in a very easy to search and filter manner. It's easy to have all the magic items, right? It's every written down content by Wizards of the Coast in one website. And that's yeah. obviously beautiful, but it also does so much more for you. It tracks characters for your players. So if you have, like me, the I think I have the Master or what Champion or whatever they call it subscription, which allows me unlimited characters, but also three campaigns with content sharing. So all my players get all the options that I already own. And we as a group pay for my account right as a yeah. play group we play we pay for that account and then it's just five dollars a year for every one of us that's something everyone can afford that's definitely manageable and that's the beauty of it we as a group just pay for it and i have the content management always enabled for their campaign they can create their characters in there for the campaign replay and if they ask me for something i can always look it up for them and always share the content with them and it works like a charm but then that's only the official side of D&D Beyond, right? There's the homebrew side. There is so much homebrew content on D&D Beyond and there's so much good content there as well. Obviously, everyone can upload homebrew content. So there's also going to be a lot of unbalanced, untested, weird shit. Yeah. But there is good shit as well. There is Matt Mercer has a few of his items and I think subclasses uploaded there for people to use. So, like, you can use the items Mighty Nine use in your game, or at least a few of them. For example, Knot's Flask is in there as an item. It's easy, it's an uncommon item or something, but it's cool. Yeah. Um, but there are obviously also way cooler items uploaded, and there's content, again, I can share content with my players, also the, mag also the homebrew and the magic items, everything. It's just an organized place where I am not organized as a GM, right? It's the organized place I need to find content. And it's not even just strictly restricted to D&D. Obviously, D&D Beyond is only for D&D, right? Yeah. But as far as I know, Pathfinder Nexus is in development, or is it already out? Um... Generally, Pathfinder Nexus is exactly the same thing as D&D Beyond, a place where you can do everything D&D Beyond does just for Pathfinder. So, yeah, if if the game you play has, and obviously I know, and I, I'm not asking for that, that's something I really want to make clear. If you're an indie developer, don't, in quotation marks, waste your time on such a thing like D&D Beyond, because you don't waste your time, in quotation marks, on making more cool games like your game you did right you don't need such a website exactly but if there is that website it's a really helpful tool and yes dnd beyond has the barrier of having to buy everything and i think pathfinder has a website where you can find every content for free even okay i know it's not illegal for a fact okay but that's good. Yeah. So, Niels, what is your... Okay, so you asked for my most used or most valuable tool, right? Yeah. So what personally in your collection of... Let's talk about preparation tools only for now. Your favorite preparation tool. OneNote. It has to be OneNote. Because I can just organize any thoughts or ideas or plans or whatever I write down, I can organize it in the way I want to and make it clean i can cross link different things i can if i homebrew something i can just write the monster stat block somewhere in OneNote, create a link to that stat block and put it in the document where i reference it so i just have to click on the name and it jumps right to that stat block and then i can just hit back button and i'm back where i was before so it's just easy to cross reference things cross link things keep everything in mind it's free it just works you can write in it you can draw in it it just works the way you want a note tool to work it's a digital notepad right and that's exactly. so cool and uses the digital things right that's why i use OneNote as well because it allows for the digital better version of a notepad in my opinion yeah i'm gonna come out and say it but digital over paper any day yeah 
And that is for one reason alone. Basically, that's the biggest reason, which is control F. Yeah, I just was about to say that you can search. Sur for a search function. I know rule books, especially for the bigger TTRPGs, are very well organized, or at least they should be. Mm -hmm. And they have an index. They also have a table of content where I could look, where I find something. But then I'm still looking at two full pages of, co of text and images where I need to find specific rule I want. And there could be like 10 rules on that page. Yeah. When I have the digital PDF, I just press Control F, type in what I want to find or any keyword about it and skip to the point where I then will find the content and easy peasy. Grappling rules are my favorite example. I can't remember a single grappling rule for D&D &D 5e. Not a chance. Yeah, fair. So I have to control F them in my PDF or on D&D Beyond, right? I can also search there. And then with my notepad, I can find the place where I'm in my notes. So maybe I over prep too much and have too much text in my notes. That could be the case, but it works for me, right? I don't know how people, how other people do their prep and what they write in their notes, but I sometimes have a hard time finding my way around my own notes. Definitely. And Control F sometimes helps me because I name every one of my bullet points with a specific keyword, which is my way of solving the problem that I could probably solve another way as well. But yep. I name my bullet points after a specific keyword, after an NPC, for example, and then I remember my NPC's name if I have written it down some one time or two times, mm -hmm. and then I can just jump to the bullet points with for that NPC. So yeah, I agree. One note as well. But there are obviously other note-taking tools, especially digital ones as well. I think there's one that's called Goblin Notebooks, which is supposed to be pretty cool. Mm -hmm. I have not checked out or looked at it, but it's I heard good things about it so far. So yeah, if you're using that, that's cool. I don't know. Maybe contact us <laughs> and tell us about it. Yeah, uh, just any kind of note-taking tool or organization tool because I have a lot of info on my notepad. There's a lot of text for example on gods and worlds and countries in that as well that oh yeah where i reference the pages once again like you said right especially for world building this is just awesome because you can yeah just link the different countries or parts of the country back to the original page and if they mention a god you can link to the god page which then leads to another thing and the history page and whatever however you want to structure it you can just make it easy for you with one or two button clicks mark it create link yeah. use the link for yeah. this yeah Bang. Yeah, though I will say one thing. I would advise against making your entire world text in your OneNote mm -hmm. because that can get messy quick. Yeah, it, it's a note taking tool. It's not a writing tool. Exactly. It's not supposed to make your text look pretty formatted. And it's not the best, for example, to make maps in for your things or something, right? Yeah, um, there are specific tools for that. Mm -hmm. So, yes. Would you please, do you use any of these tools that help you world build specifically? Specifically for world building, probably I would have to say the fantasynamegenerators.com, the website. Oh, you're going to go there. For world building this, or if you're talking maps, I mostly use Incarnate. No, I'm not talking about those two things specifically. I'm talking about things like World Anvil, services that are supposed to to make you help you write your ooh, text and, ooh. and do the actual world building. I do not. Okay. I, I just have a scrambled mess of notes for my worlds right now. Yeah, okay. But the thing is that, for example, World Anvil, which is free for the first 140 articles, I think, about your world, makes a wiki page about your world, which is super well to navigate if you do it right. Wow, okay. And also the um, memberships are pretty cheap. I uh, have been playing a lot with getting Getting one, especially for Titans Cold's world. But yeah, um, World Anvil is great in my opinion. But there are also other things. There are, I think it's Legend Keeper, which is also another one. Well, one of the th things both have is the option of interactive maps. Okay, that's that's awesome. Having a map of your world, if you have the map of your world, and putting pins in it, and then linking to the articles on that. That is something OneNote can't do easily. Yeah. Right. You could make the hyperlink an icon of a pin you put at the exact spot in the map and then click on it and then get linked to the page but still then yeah one or just has one block of text right there is not much formatting but word anvil allows you to have so much it really looks like a good structured 
page for you and it gives you prompts for your for example for your countries it, it has specific text boxes for specific things about that country so it helps you world build organically as you write i only use word anvil as an example because word anvil is the only one that i have found that has a free membership option which i used and now i'm full of 140 articles and need to buy something so my world looks like shit right now because it's not remotely finished yet but it's so easy to just put words on paper there because you get prompts like okay what is the social structure of this country and then you start thinking and then you write five sentences and hit enter and it updates your wiki page to that thing it looks really well and it allows for map support it allows for one of the beauty most beautiful things i found on world anvil which they advertise quite a lot is the family trees Ooh, oh you, you you can make family trees with world anvil you can make connections between npcs it's beautiful really i will so, definitely have to take a look so that. yeah th that's what i meant oh, with damn. these tools that keep track of your world right that help you world build or help you create and maintain your world that's another thing okay Niels. But please, now that I've talked for long enough, what is the next tool you want to talk about? I don't have any good way to talk about the next and any next tool. So what's your next tool you want to talk about? L let's keep on the prepping side yeah. first. I would say let's stay on prepping. Mm -hmm. Obviously, map tools are a huge thing if you like to use maps or if you like to use maps for your notes to keep track of whatever stuff you're working on. Mm -hmm. If you need a visual reference for the area you are prepping right now, having a map can do a lot of work for you. And the tool I personally use is Incarnate because I would like to try this one day, but I haven't. But I like the option to create my own stamps, draw my own stamps and then upload them so I can use them for my own maps. Mm -hmm. It has this option available to me. The beauty of being someone that has any artistic talent uh, Thanks. next to me that has none. D okay. Don't say no artistic talent. I mean, we I don't have any show. artistic talent. I, I don't have any of the, uh, okay, let's say a traditional artistic talent. I'm not good at art, not good at music, not good at poetry or writing, but I am good at making others have fun. And I, I think that's something that counts. That's definitely something artistic. Yeah, but it's not traditional. Yeah. Well, it kind of Okay, now let is. me let let me sit in my own uh, self-loathing, okay? Please okay, continue okay. talk more. <laughs> yeah, um I just use I use this for my world map or for the main continent right now that we that is discovered at the time most of my sessions play in or most of my campaigns play in. And then I had the rough idea where everything should be then i took notes on what is where then i went back to incarnate and made another map a more zoomed in version of a specific country for example and then i could zoom in on a city or a region or whatever i can just make multiple different maps with beautiful stamps pr stamp presets with different types or styles of maps presets there it is it is a cool tool mm -hmm. to use because you can make maps that would l look like some cartographer or map maker in a fantasy setting would actually have drawn it. You can add borders to it, text, street lines, trade routes, rivers, forests, everything. And this is the beauty of this tool, kind of. You can use it to make battle maps, overworld maps, dungeon maps, rough sketches, and really fleshed out beautiful ones. Yeah, yeah. I use paint.net for that. I mean, as long as it works. Sketches of my world and, and then use the eraser and, and, and paint and the paintbrush tool to draw coastlines and then I draw mountains and then I draw rivers and, and I draw everything by hand and it looks like shit. I mean, as long as it works for everyone you're playing with, including you, that's fine. I am so ready to at some point spend just like 100 or 200 or 300 bucks or however costly it is to get some real cartographer commissioned to just use that sketch i made and make a real map with it oh yeah that... and and say hey i don't care just make this look good do as you want and uh i'm fine with it basically you you have my sketch on the sketches everything i important the rest is up to you okay do whatever you want put in a volcano somewhere i can work with everything all right. Commission a real cartographer to make your own homebrew world 
map is awesome. It, it just the the final product for you for the group you're playing with. It's just awesome to have an on hand map to use. Yeah, but. Coming back to prepping tools, obviously the name generators are a big Yeah, name generators. I think, especially with name generators, we're now also passing into in-session tools, kind mm -hmm. of, because you can use them in-session as well. Then I have to make a quick intermission there be before we delve into the overlapping yeah. part. Yeah, please go. Um, Reddit forums yeah. are a huge thing. Like r slash D&D. Any or, forum, really. You yeah. could also use Twitter. You can use the Instagram chat section if you want to. You can use N-World as a forum for that. Any place where you can discuss with other dungeon masters, really, right? Exactly. This podcast. Use for us example. as your next DM tool. Listen to us and get inspired to be better. Easy peasy, please. There you go. Yeah. But uh, this was just a quick intermission before going to the overlapping part because using forums or our podcast in session ha, might not work as well for you or in general. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I can see that. Yeah. Because you have to filter through so many information that mm -hmm. you in quotation marks waste too much time on it for an in session kind of deal. Yeah. Yeah. 100%. Um, I have another thing as well I want to talk about, mm -hmm. which is a very fun tool which is called Fade Weaver. Okay, I haven't, I haven't heard of it. It's this very interesting um, little tool by someone from uh, the Twitter community. Um, it's not much, but it's basically just a free tool to make interconnected dots with the relationships between them. Okay. You can use that as a DM to keep track of party and, and NPC relationships. You can use it as a player for even two to make your complex backstory, NPCs and places show up. Basically, it's a place where you can map relations between everyone. That's cool. And it, it's, it's simple, but it's actually very effective in helping you understand who knows who, who knows what, and who understands how and, and all that. And, and where everyone, for example, says you can put the dots wherever you want them, right? You can... You can, if you have a war between two kingdoms, and that's the setting for your campaign, then you can make all the dots on the one side red and all the others blue, or uh, keep them on different sides, and those are then the two different sides of the combat, and your player's in the middle, and then you can connect them to whatever, right? And oh, yeah. it's, it's very easy for organization, and it works, and it's cool, and it, th that's all that really is to it. But it's a good tool, but you can still also use it in session when you want to add something to it, hmm. right? Obviously, obviously, you can use all the prepping tools also in session, and you can use all the in session tools also in prep, right? Yeah. But, 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 it's, but there is... Some really have the focus of working for your session and some have the focus for working for your prep. And this tool really has a focus for working for prep, but it helps a lot in session because you can easily make a screenshot of that map you made of the different characters and NPCs. And then you have that as a quick overview of who knows who. And that question alone is very important, right? Because oh, yeah. that question is one of the most important things you will ever ask yourself when your players talk to an NPC. What does this NPC actually know? And that also implies who does this NPC know? Oh, yeah. Where could they get information? Who do they know? What can they tell your players? And that's... Um, yeah. Uh, one uh, Another tool I use sometimes in session and for prep is donjon.bin because it has beautiful generators for shops, inns, taverns, all that stuff that might be hard to come up on the fly or improvise. You can just hit generate, you get a, a shopkeep description, an item list, or a menu for the tavern. Obviously, this needs to be somewhat tweaked to your setting because it, this is a general fantasy most of the time. Yeah. But you can use that. I think there are some lists or some generators for alien or star kind of things mm, there are, I think there's so a too, lot yeah. of thing on there generally fantasy generators are so great like even if you don't use the things they actually put out they give you inspiration exactly and that's huge but they also are such a quick tool to use in session right yeah boom hit a button okay boom i know this now 
and I'm just gonna run with that fact because that fact is um, at least somewhat r made realistic, right? Yeah, it is somewhat believable in any way, shape or form at least. Yeah, exactly. Um, so do you have any other tools that would be considered more prep tool than an in-session tool? Uh, one thing that writes this line pretty hard Mm -hmm. that, that jumps rope with it, basically, would be mm -hmm. D&D Speak. It's basically a collection of D100 lists for any ki mm -hmm. kind of medieval fantasy medieval setting. It isn't D&D specific, but I think they've used the name because it's the most popular fantasy RPG, probably, something like this. Mm -hmm. But there are D100 lists or generators for inspiration for your players to start off role-playing conversations. Or some stories they might hear in a tavern from some other adventurers. Mm -hmm. This I use for maybe some filler th stuff or to engage them more in roleplay. Or use as inspiration to come up with my own shit. Nice. Yeah, definitely. All things that help you come up with inspiration are basically great tools. Yeah. And you fi you need to find the ones that actually help you and the ones that don't. As I said, encounter lists are great as inspiration for me. But I will never roll on them for my game yeah. to to actually run what I roll because that I can't I just can't do. But inspiration that's oh, why yeah. I don't want them. For example, gone from adventures, from published things or third party things because they're great. I just will never use them in the way they've been put into the game. <laughs> exactly. That's just yeah. me. Um. So Niels, please. Now we're yes. going over into the physical tool side. What's your yeah. favorite physical? for session tool basically my most used or my most favorite in game or in session type of tool would be music speakers boxes speaker phones whatever just to put on ambience music ambient sound to create atmosphere all that kind of thing that conveys feelings or yeah conveys the emotional feeling of a situation you're in yeah i mean we did an episode on music with eli from made roleplay which is one of the greatest episodes we've ever done yet oh, yeah to date but generally the existence of music for your game does wonders in my opinion it's really great it can be distracting to some but especially if it's just ambient small things i think it can enhance the game really really well oh yeah it can just get you immersed that that little bit more or that yeah. much more whatever yeah yeah you, you have to put in some work i highly suggest making yeah. sure that you have at least in some way music for example when we when i played out of house and was the gm i just had my 15 dollar tablet from a no-name brand which is now at this point probably 10 years old or even 11 years old mm -hmm. in 2022 and it works and the speakers are totally fine for what we need I just need some place where I can store a lot of music. I think there are like 30 gigabytes of music on that thing for mm -hmm. D&D, fantasy, and also a bit of sci-fi music uh, for my campaigns. And that's all I need. And then I just press the playlist and let it run. And it's easy. It's simple. I use music from everywhere. We talked about that with Eli. But this thing works and it's all I need. And it does so much, even though I don't have great speakers. And when we played out, out of house, and I mean out in the wild, more or less. We yeah. played in a garden for several, uh, like two years in a row. We met for like from April to like September only in a the garden. There, I also just put that thing right next to my DM screen, press, press the button and it still worked. It still gave everyone the feeling of the music oh, and yeah. that helped a lot. So yeah, just any way to convey music really um, yeah. is a great thing to have. Yeah. Oh, another thing I like to use is our sticky notes, post-it notes, or whatever in conjunction with a Game Master screen. Because I can just prepare any kind of information I might need, some quick rule references, name lists, or whatever on there, and just pin them on the inside of my screen to have quick access to the information I want to access. And I all, all, nearly always have some sort of sticky note block next to me, so I can wrote write shit down in the moment and then just pin it down there if I might need it later in the session. Yeah, I I, I agree. Sticky notes uh, or general anything where you can have simple notes stored is great. I just use my um, tablet, uh, my other tablet, which my, my brand tablet, which is more notebook. Uh, I use that mm -hmm. for my uh, quick notes, um, but sticky notes work as well. I use what what I would think is adjacent to sticky notes is initiative trackers. 
Oh yeah. I make uh, for my games. I make name cards with that have the name on one side, and on the other side they have specific information about the character. In mm. D&D that would be AC, HP, um, all the ability scores, or at least their bonuses, their saving throw proficiencies, or where they are proficient in, and their passive stats, and I think a few other things. Basically, it's it's really just a few information on them. And the other side is their name. Like, it's right there's a name shield. And I put that on my DM screen, and then oh, shuffle yeah. them around for initiative, and then I can, on my end, walk the initiative and my players see the initiative as well because they see their names in order but they also never forget names of the other player characters yes this is actually a fact that happens at my table sometimes you forget the names of your other player characters having 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 any kind of indication of names of others helps even though these names aren't actually connected to the player yet or they they never are but just reading the name helps already right oh, they've yeah. heard the name before they just need this little push to remember the name and that's exactly. all they need but also this is a great way for me to keep track of every stat because one thing one problem i have with dnd beyond it's not really a problem it's just that it's an inconvenience because of how i run my games i don't get an overview of all the character stats in the campaign oh yeah that that would be good i always have only one character sheet open from them and that's all and i can only see that but i never see the others passive inside i just have to go to each individual character and look at their passive perception for example or i could ask the players obviously yes i can do that but i can also just write it down on my side and then i have it yeah. so yeah that's something i always use another thing for in session tools which might sound a little obvious and strange that we consider the tool but obviously a dm screen yeah it, th- this is part of this because there is information on that that you might need if you are talking D D, the official D D dungeon master screen has all the conditions on it the shapes of area of effect spells the size the sizes difficulty classes all that kind of thing or if you use a, a more generic screen there are empty sheet holders where you can just place a piece of paper whatever kind of thing you want to put on there is your thing or you can use lined paper put it in there and write on this with wet erase markers and then just use it for whatever type of game you want to use it for and write your references for rules or anything else on there yeah yeah i think especially the customizable ones are the are the way to go i have a generic one with no back side made of wood that i put mm-hmm. in front of the normal one that i have for D purposes i had i have the normal dungeon master screen i'm just behind that mm-hmm. and and have it there but also the thing of a dm screen it's to hide things from your players right and and we've talked about this a lot of times in 50 episodes no, normally you're not the person to hide something for your players and the thing is i agree right the dm screen should be the barrier between you and your players it, it doesn't yeah. have to be only if you want to make it one it will become one it, it, it marks a place that is designated for you something yeah. your players just respect not peeking behind because you have your notes there you might have a handout there which is another tool you can use mm-hmm. but generally you have a handout there that your players are not supposed to read or see until they get there right virtual tabletops obviously also take care of the m screen because you should decide when to reveal what to your players but but at, at a physical table the screen is just there to make sure that you have your designated space that you have a place to store all the things you need as a dm and have the safety that your players don't cheat right if you put a hand out of the of the monster down uh, on the table and it's a dragon a red dragon and your players don't prepare fire spells the next day because they know they're gonna fight the dragon that's kind of against the purpose right you don't want that because that's meta gaming it prevents exactly. your players from cheating more or less and that's cool that's a good feature it shouldn't be the screen to hide your dice rolls because you're meticulous fudging everything or hide your evil plans it's just a barrier to make sure that the game stays fun and uh, surprising as well because surprise is a big part of D or in general any ttrpg really yeah. so Niels, i talked about two different tools in my to- rant about dm screens which of that one do you want to talk about first let's talk about handouts okay then let's go the big one basically handouts are in awesome way to create memorable situation at your table especially if you're playing in person because there's something your players can all sit around and all read themselves and touch and be part of the same 
thing. Being it a letter from a family member of one of the party's characters or a puzzle that you design could be one thing that you could give as a handout to them. It just creates immersion for everyone at the table and engagement in the story you are telling. Because especially with the immersion part, if one character is getting a letter and is reading it, nobody else will see what is in that letter until they read it themselves. If you read out the letter to everyone at the table, just saying only this person gets this letter, everyone still knows what's in there. This might be hard to separate. But mm -hmm. if you really give them the letter, they can decide, yeah, I want to give everyone the letter so they can read that. Or no, I'm keeping that for myself. This creates some, not tension, but mystery and keeps engagement and immersion high. And I think that's one huge factor of handouts, or at least one they can have. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, yeah, I mean, we talked about handouts in the puzzle episode, for example, and how important they are there, right? Handouts always give a common basis. They are a physical tool that help you keep immersion alive. Yeah. Even if they're not pretty necessarily, right? That's another thing about it entirely. You can make them very pretty. You can make use burnt paper. You can use like Niels does. Niels has stamps. Yeah. Um, Niels has wax. And that's something as well. You can make your own letters with that. You can make typography and all of that beautiful, right? But the thing about it is that it keeps, like you said, the immersion alive of who knows what's in this handout. Because the handouts are player specific. You give it to one player and they decide if the others even see. Exactly. Um, and yeah, then I want to talk about virtual tabletops. And oh my God, April, April 2022. Mm -hmm. Was it April 20, 2022? No, 2020, obviously. Sorry, everyone. April 2020. That's when I started using virtual tabletops for the first time in my life. Because that was the first time I was forced to take up virtual tabletops to continue with my favorite hobby because I couldn't do it in person anymore. We all know why. But the thing is, I never will go without a virtual tabletop ever again. Or at least in some way, shape or form what virtual tabletops provide to me. Because they provide a virtual ta table. It's in the name it's so easy to understand but a way to handle the handouts a way to handle player specific information a way to handle music a way to handle maps a way to handle images a way to handle combat a way to handle i could go on and on and on and on and there are so many good ones to use i use roll 20 because it has a free membership i'm thinking about switching to foundry though because i've heard only good things about it there are there's fantasy grounds if we want to go dnd i think that's dnd specific there are there's tabletop simulator right all of these help you imitate yeah. a table and the feeling you have around a table oh yeah to at least some degree and especially in these times now i've learned that virtual tabletops are very helpful because even if i have now play in person again it's so amazing really and yeah i use it in person as well i then have a way to show my players handouts so i don't have to print them out because the only thing i hate about handouts is that i have to print them because printing is expensive mm -hmm. but it's also a way for me to show them the battle maps so i don't have to print out or draw the battle maps because those look terrible when i draw a battle map on the 100 pages of um one inch gridded paper which i have um which i don't want to draw on anymore because i'm not good at it so yeah i can just use the maps i make in my mapping softwares yeah it's just so convenient and i think that's one reason why if you scour the internet you find a lot of tabletops or gaming tables that have a built-in screen in the middle where you can just open up the battle map for exactly that reason. You can make the battle map or whatever kind of map in your mapping tool and then use the file, the picture or the virtual tabletop to display it in the middle of the table for everyone to see. Mm -hmm. And that, that's one thing or one additional reason where you could use a virtual tabletop even if you're playing in person. Yeah. Yeah, 100% agree on that. So I don't think I have any other tools really. Do you have any other tool you want to talk about that's really important for you? Not really. Just in preparation for a session, but not pre uh, preparing the session per se would be drawings for me. Mm -hmm. For example, of characters, NPCs, monsters, or whatever. If I homebrew them, I might be able to draw them in the time allocated to that, mm -hmm. but it's just a fun way to process even things that happened. Mm -hmm. sometimes rather than just taking notes mm -hmm. for me. I would say yeah that's uh, a way you 
do it. I don't have that way, as I said. Yeah. So I go with note taking and, and thinking. But yeah, creative dialogue is something that helps me a lot. Talking to other people like oh, you yeah. or yeah, other yeah. DMs in the Unchapped chat. I know some of them are listening right now. You guys help me a lot, even though it's when we just meme each other ra- around. But there are some very valuable creative discussions with friends and other people that help a lot in prepping. And that is another tool you... that That's, that's not a physical tool, but it's another tool you could use as a DM, right? Yeah. My biggest advice about tools is find the ones that you want to use and evaluate as many as you can. From, for the most that I use, there's no price. I don't think there's a price barrier for any except for D&D Beyond, maybe, because you have to buy the books. Mm-hmm. But generally, all I've listed is basically free. Yeah. Because payment is one of the biggest barriers for me. I don't want to pay for this stuff as long as I don't know how good I can use it. Exactly. Right? That's why I haven't paid for World Envoy yet. But I might do it because it works for me. I might also investigate Legend Keep a little bit more before I do that step. But yeah, I think with that, we we're at the end of this episode and highlighted a few tools we use. Are there any other tools you guys use? If so, please add us on Twitter and talk to us about them. I would be interested in learning more about different tools that I didn't even know about yet. But if you found anything that you liked here, you can check them out by a quick Google search. I don't think I have to put links in the description for all of them or any of them really. But yeah, f- find the tools you want to use. Have fun with that. Make sure your prepping and running games goes Uh, Again, according to one of the core tenants, so you're comfortable and then you're good to go. So, Niels, please finish us off with this episode. Exactly. And with that, you can follow us on Twitter and Instagram at DoubleDMPod. You can visit our website at www.doubledm.com or you could donate to us on Ko-Fi. And with that, thank you for listening. Have a great one. Hear you on the next one. And bye-bye. Bye-bye, people.